this net zero plan is not actually about saving the climate or avoiding the world from being destroyed. Mm -hmm. It is a political decision that is used to crack down on people's freedom and people's rights. Hello and welcome to Marshall Matters with me, Winston Marshall, at the Spectator offices in London. You might have seen since 2019, the Dutch farmers have been taking their tractors to the highways, their hay bales stacking up across the roads, protesting various government policies against the so-called nitrogen crisis. And this week, newly formed political party representing the farmers have won 17 seats in the Dutch Senate, becoming the largest party in the Senate. And to discuss what's happening and to give me a history of uh, the uh, protests is a political activist, a, a woman that you might have seen at the forefront of some of those protests, but also a, a legal scholar, a journalist, and a political commentator, Ava Vladingers Broek. Yeah. Good. Did I pronounce correctly? Yeah, no, 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 that was good. Ava, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I understand you're in London actually uh, as part of a, a debate on net zero, which I think is probably related to this topic. So hopefully we can get into that. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. Later. Yeah, it's... Uh, um, but before that, I was hoping we could get into the Dutch farmer protests and what exactly is happening in the Netherlands. And um, I believe a good possible starting point would be 2019, when the first policies from the government were introduced with the intention of halving Dutch livestock right. um, to battle the so-called nitrogen crisis. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, you're already obviously very well read on the subject because it's true. This is a, a fight that has been going on for quite a few years now. So it was in 2019 that the Dutch government decided that nitrogen was a problem. Um, and in the years before that, actually, uh, they said that phosphate was the problem. So from 2015 to 2019, it was phosphate. Mm. And then they, um, they shifted to the, uh, the focus to, to nitrogen. And so nitrogen emissions had to be cut. That was the, the entire idea. And the farmers were the ones that were, you know, according to the government, the, the largest group responsible for the nitrogen emissions. And therefore, they would have to well, uh, cut down in size drastically and eventually even, you know, we'll, we'll get into that, but maybe even be expropriated. So can we talk about the nitrogen crisis? What, what is the crisis? So, so what I've understood is that uh, the Netherlands is the second highest average gross nitrogen balance on agriculture land. In kilograms per hectare, the Netherlands is the second highest and with almost twice the average European country. Mm. And uh, so what's the problem with nitrogen? And... Um, what, what is this so-called crisis? Well, exactly, so-called crisis. So mm -hmm. I don't even think that we should be calling it a crisis at all. You know, really, it's a political decision. It's a crisis that I think only exists on paper. Because if you really look at, you know, like nitrogen deposition, what really is the problem there? So I might get technical for a little bit Please here, do. but I think it's important to know. So the Dutch government is basing its nitrogen policies on European legislation, on EU legislation. And that is the Natura or the Nature 2000 um, like regulation from the EU. And that regulation is about designated areas all over Europe that are supposed to be basically natural preserves, you know, that you need to protect. And in the Netherlands, we have 162 of those. And well, anybody who's ever been to my country knows it's, you know, obviously it's very tiny and, you know, we're not really known for our, um, <laughs> our landscapes or, you know, advanced nature there or, or well, you, you know, you know, we're the, we're the lowlands. A lot of our land is agricultural. It's not exactly that people come to Holland for the amazing forests or the natural reserves or whatever. It's like someone took a rolling pin to the whole country. Right. Yeah. 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 And it's actually true because, I mean, the Netherlands, 80 percent of our land is actually is farmland. So and we're very densely populated. So I'm not surprised, obviously, that we have compared to other European countries, for example, high nitrogen emissions because we're such a tiny country and everything is so packed together and we have a lot of farmland. Um, because we are the second largest exporter of agricultural products in the world. That's important context, I think, because it's your second behind the United States, but yeah. you're a country the size of, I think, Maryland. And the most, not only the most efficient farmers in the world, but 
without question, the most efficient farmers to ever grace the planet. Absolutely. Uh, I think I saw one uh, fact that the uh, the average farmer takes 22 uh, li liters of water to to produce a pound of tomatoes, whereas the Dutch farmers can do it in half a liter or something. Oh, right. no, gallons, sorry, gallons, half a gallon. Um, and, and you've pioneered vertical farming, and there's something like uh, the area of two Manhattans worth of greenhouses um, mm. in, in Netherlands. So you are leading the world in, yeah. in, in, in the farming, in agriculture. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, that's really important to know. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we've been a farming nation for centuries. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the people uh, that are farmers today, you know, it's not just them, it's their, their, their ancestors, their, their grandparents, their grand, grand grandparents. So it's knowledge that has built up over centuries and they are incredibly good at it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, second largest ex ex um, exporter of agricultural products mm -hmm. for a country that's half the size of Indiana, you know, that's mm -hmm. then you're doing something right there. Mm -hmm. um, but so to come back to the so-called nitrogen crisis, these natural areas or these natural preserves that they've said can't change, that, that's the idea. So they say, for example, you know, we have a couple of sand dunes um, that now they've decided they, that the outlook on, of those can't change um, in relationship to how they looked, for example, 25 years ago. So it's completely arbitrary. They don't want certain plants to grow there. I don't understand. What do you mean by sand dune? A couple of sand like dunes. Sand, I'm just, just an example, but they're like, you know, there are certain fields where they say that they don't want a, a specific type of plant to grow there. Mm -hmm. Or they don't want, um, you know, the, the meadows to become forests. Those the government natural. doesn't want yeah uh -huh. see so like that's literally the whole idea of these these protected areas is that they can't change they have to look exactly the same as they did 25 years ago because they are protected natural preserves uh -huh. um, and the thing is with nitrogen what nitrogen does is that it promotes plant growth mm -hmm. so it could you could potentially argue you know if there's a lot of nitrogen that gets too close to this natural area that maybe certain plants will start growing there and we don't want those plants to grow there because the area is protected mm -hmm. that's the crisis mm -hmm. okay <laughs> see what i'm saying and you know obviously it's even it remains to be seen if that is actually if the farmers actually are responsible for that is you that know? only that is that the only problem with the nitrogen that is the does it not Getting into seawater, getting into the water system, is there not a is is it is it not greater issue than just that? No, they're already really really good at all of that. So the farmers, you know, like we just discussed, they're they're incredibly efficient, hard workers, and already very technologically advanced. Mm -hmm. So you know, the Dutch farmers are usually have been renowned to be incredibly uh, sustainable. Actually, mm -hmm. you know, very, I would say, like probably technologically top, top, top of their game mm -hmm. when it comes to protecting the area. Because always no farmer wants their land to go bad, you know, especially if you otherwise you would you would miss out on, well, your your income, your revenue, and they wouldn't be producing anymore. So it okay. can't be going that so horribly wrong. What is in the mindset of the politicians who think that the nitrogen crisis is so dramatic that they have to bring in policy as dramatic as halving mm. livestock production. That is huge right. uh, policy. What, what is going through their mind that they think that that is a good idea? Well, that's the thing. So I think that they don't actually believe that there is a crisis, but that they use this pretext, you know, of nitrogen, because otherwise, why would you, you know, we talk a lot about carbon and things like that. You know, ammonia has a small role in this, this whole story as well. Um, but why would you, why would you be so upset about nitrogen? You know, the fact that they chose nitrogen, I think, is because it affects the farmers directly more than any other group in the country. So, you know, you, if you use that as a pretext, you know, if you switch from phosphate, which apparently didn't work, but you go to nitrogen now, and you use that for an actual, for a different agenda than actually the climate or nature, then it starts to make sense. You know, so if you start, if you know that the agenda behind it is something else, then it makes sense why they would choose this. Okay, so what's the agenda? Land. It's very simple. So the government, like I just said, the Dutch, we're a very tiny country. Mm -hmm. We have a massive population growth due to, for, for example, immigration. Actually, at this very moment, only immigration because the natural growth of our country is completely halted. Mm. Um, so, but we, we are, we're packed, you know, we don't, we have a housing crisis that we do have mm -hmm. and we need 
new houses where people can live, but there's no, there's no available land. So the government actually says this in a couple of their own, um, in their own reports, when they talk about farmland and when they talk about potential expropriation, they say that they need housing space, you know? So that's one of the reasons. And then obviously if a country for 80% uh, exists of farmland, well then, you know, the state doesn't control that. So it would obviously help them very much if they own more of, <laughs> of the actual country. Why are they not having that conversation? I mean, you suggest that there's some evidence for it, but why wouldn't they have that conversation just outright mm. instead of going around this sort of uh, which borderline conspiratorial, like, well, if we take their land by introducing this, we can Because people can go would never accept door. it. If they tell the truth, people would never accept it. You know, so if you, if you make up a crisis, if you say, well, this is for the, for the benefit of the world, you know, we don't want nature to go bad. It sounds morally you know, sound, it sounds good. It sounds like you're doing a virtuous thing. So if you convince an entire population or even the entire world that there is a crisis and that, well, you, we all have to do our part, you know, we all have to give up certain rights in order to solve this, then people will probably be more inclined to politically accept that and even do it than when they say, oh, well, actually, you know, we just haven't protected our borders. We're you know, letting in too many people. Uh, we don't have land. We don't know what to do here. We need it now. So fork it over, you know, and we're going to start building houses. But isn't that too drastic? Because if, let's say, what is, am I right in understanding that um, net migration into the Netherlands is something like 400,000 a year? Is that, is that correct? What's this the year, yeah. This year it this was 400,000. Which is obviously huge. Massive. Yeah. But if 80% of the land of the Netherlands is for agriculture, you don't, and so only 20% is for the existing its population or the rest, you don't need to halve agriculture mm. to, for, for, to obtain land. You only need a small amount of land. To, right. for the, even if it's 400,000 people, you don't need that much land. Yeah, see, you're asking all the rational questions. Yeah. So, But the fact that you're, that to me, their true intent is revealed by asking these types of rational questions and not getting you know, a rational answer back. Because if you, if you ask these types of questions, you'd think, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. No, exactly. It doesn't make any sense. So the fact that it doesn't make any sense shows you that they actually have a different goal. And so the immigration part, I think, is one side of the story. Definitely, you know, it has to do, they, they have a problem with housing. Of course they do. You know, they need more land in order to house people if you don't protect your borders, if you allow migration record to be broken year after year, which has been the case in our country. Um, but there is another aspect, and that is something that I personally think is maybe even more important. It's what do you want like for your country? Like, how do you want your country to look? What do you want? What type of people does the state function best with in independent, self-reliant, hardworking people like farmers or people who, you know, are much more dependent on the state, who, um, basically, you know, are perfect consumers, I think probably the latter. So farmers, as you've seen during the protests as well, you know, they're, they're a strong subgroup. So the immediate, my immediate thought when you say that is that if, and I understand that Netherlands last year had 105 billion euro uh, revenue from exporting agricultural goods, i.e. massive. Surely the government recognized that by, that that is a huge amount of income for the company, uh, for the company, the, the country, mm -hmm. Why, why would they want to jeopardize that? Well, they'll start focusing on alternative forms of, you know, protein, which is already what they're doing for, which is interesting. We have, I think three or four insect farms now in the Netherlands, and that's something that they're promoting heavily. So I think, you know, eventually having that land, sure, agricultural, you know, revenue is big, but having the land and building houses and selling those, for example, is also a very lucrative market. And then the government owns the land. And if you own something, you can, you know, generate revenue off of that for yourself for a much longer time than when it actually goes to, for example, the farmers. Because we have a lot of farmers, you know, there are 50,000 uh, farms in the country. And they're not all, they're not all major corporations. You know, you, I've, I speak to a lot of farmers who have maybe 120 cows. Those are tinier companies, but they are, there's, you know, you'll, if you meet some Dutch farmers, they're very, they're strong spirited. Mm -hmm. They're very well organized. They know each other. I think together with maybe the dock workers, they are the only group 
self-reliant group in the country that actually is able to put up a fight against government policies. And well, you know, if we get to our election results, you'll see that that is actually has been the case. They have the manpower to really derail the government if they want to. And that's not something that I think any government that aims for power and control wants. Okay. So I, 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 this might be a small detail, but with the, the point about protein and insect, is it, is it, is it that that new industry would create more, would generate greater wealth than the current agricultural no, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily making that claim, but okay. I mean more in the sense that they are promoting different types of, you know, they're saying we can do it another way. And all, obviously also under the guise again of net zero, because they're saying that we need to drastically lower our meat intake, for example. So they will come up with all sorts of alternatives to say, you know, you don't have to starve, <laughs> for example. But I think financially, you know, their benefit is, is in, in land ownership rather uh -huh. than necessarily insects, for example. Is it that there's a, a, a clash of um, worldviews or, or philosophy? So, so in, in the Netherlands, there's a, a, a proud history of progressive politics. It's one of the oldest liberal nations. I'm not sure it's the first, but certainly one of the first. And, and um, uh, what um, there's, I think even now there's a party for the animals. It's like there's, there's a Green Party and there's... Um, uh, sort of pr proud liberal history there, and I, I wonder if if is there is there a are these current politicians in, in imposing this policy, and actually we should get into what the policy is. Um, are they do they perhaps just have such a drastic different worldview and and concept of the climate crisis that that's what's driving this this because that's what we've we've been seeing in the rest of the world is is this uh, kind of religious. Um, following of of climate apocalypta that one needs to deal with that and that that actually that is clouding their minds and making them uh, impose it imp uh, encouraging them to impose this policy that is actually hurting the working classes and the farmers more than ever that that's what it seems to me yeah, to be going on rather than uh, a, pl a plot to kind of capture more land or change industry well, I, th I think it it's both. both. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's probably both. So, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, and there are definitely people who I think truly believe that if we do this, that that helps the climate, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you definitely probably have people there who are not ill willed, so to say. I think there are a lot of government officials who know better, um, but it definitely is a clash of worldviews. And actually, I think that with that, that actually strengthens maybe the argument of why our government wants to get rid of them, because they have a different view of what our country should look like. You know, the farmers, if you go to the Dutch countryside, you know, they might not be incredibly politically outspoken or anything, but they're at heart very conservative people. Usually most people who work with their hands and who well, create food, quite literally, you know, they're very literally down to earth people mm -hmm. who work with the knowledge that has been passed on them through tradition. Mm -hmm. And so most Dutch farmers, when you meet them, they are very sober, very, you know, they're not people who are going to spend a ton of money, like I said, not perfect consumers. They're oftentimes Christian still, um, mm -hmm. very family oriented, you know, what basically the country used to look like, let's say, 60 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, you, you'll still find that in the Dutch countryside and especially it's embodied by the farmers. So I make this argument all the time, actually, that I think that the Dutch farmers are not just, they're not just farmers. They stand for a different worldview, mm -hmm. you know, of produce of, I think, actually taking care of the creation. I think most Dutch farmers do that incredibly well, even though the liars in The Hague will tell you something else. Um, very, fa very family what oriented. Will they tell you? Well, obviously that they're horrible peak polluters who uh, destroy our nature and need to go. And, you know, the, the animal party, for example, the Greens will say that they that they mistreat their animals, which I find to be a, a, like honestly laughable a joke. If you go to the farms and you see how I was with a farmer the other week where he, he, he was showing me his cows and he was he called them all by their names, hmm. you know. He knew them all. And then the Green will say, that, or the Animal Party will, yeah, but we'll kill them later for food. Well, yes, you know, not everybody's a vegan. Mm -hmm. Not everybody ascribes to your worldview and what you think morally is correct. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that these people are all monsters. They're the ones feeding you. Uh -huh. You know, so I, I, think, I think that what you are saying is correct. 
it is a completely different worldview. It's not the worldview of, you know, um, the, the globalist institutions where we all have to abide by the net zero rules and we all own nothing, but we just share everything and you watch Netflix all day and you have your nine to five job behind a computer. No, obviously these farmers lead very, very different lives. Yeah. So maybe that alternative is exactly what bothers them. You know, that that's... That have you got a concept go. of what that cultural uh, division looks like in the Netherlands? Like we've talked about in America being a divided nation and you can sort of see it split and uh, where those divides are. What's it look like in Netherlands? Is it is it city versus countryside? Is yes. it r yeah, rural urban? Yeah. Yeah. It's city versus countryside. It's funny if you even look, if you look at the election results, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, this was technically, these were the provincial state elections. So there we have 12 provinces in the country. And so they're regional, but they end up indirectly dictating what the Senate looks like. So that's why they're very, very important. But they're regional. And so if you look at the regions separately, the BBB, the Farmers Party, was the biggest in every single province. Because the countryside, you know, in those provinces, they go vote. And that's unprecedented. We've never seen that before, that one party became the biggest one in every separate region of the country. Uh-huh. But that happened because the countryside votes. Because if you then zoom in on the cities within those provinces, it's it's quite literally, you know, you'll see Amsterdam is green left, uh -huh. uh, is, is D66 or a Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. But then you go maybe, you know, 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers outside of the country, and suddenly it's all BBB again. Where have those votes come from? Which parties have they moved from? They've moved mostly from the Christian Democratic Party. Uh -huh. So that used to be, you know, our... It has been a, a ruling party for the longest time, for, mm -hmm. for decades. And, and we actually had a couple of prime ministers year, or I should say actually time and time again in a row, really, mm -hmm. uh, coming from that party. It's like, you know, it used to be the backbone of our society, uh, the moderate, center-right, Christian, down-to-earth type of party. Uh -huh. But they have completely abandoned their own people. First really? of all, they're a Christian only in name. But also the idea of them being a center-right, moderate, somewhat conservative party, they've completely abandoned and they, they've been working together mostly with the neoliberals. So Mark Rutte's ruling party, the VVD, and the Democrats. They're Honestly, they're the same party, I would say, the Democratic Party and the VVD. So what is it, sort of a technocratic centrist? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, very, globalist. Very globalist, very um, pro-EU oriented towards, well, I would say more an international interest than mm -hmm. the interest of, of the country itself and then i think that well if there's anything that we can really say about these elections is that the dutch people have have said no we don't want that uh -huh. we do not want that and that's why they voted for this party well i want to get to the election and the implications of what that means but before that maybe we could just do a little bit of history sure. forgive me if i ask any uh, simple or ignorant questions but so we started in 2019 which was when the first policy of uh trying to, to address the nitrogen issue uh, with halving livestock. And then it seems that ev almost every year since then, there's been new policy yep. always addressing the nitrogen uh, crisis, so-called. And uh, at the same time, um, uh, the growing protests, uh, the, you've talked about that there's been uh, such such uh, uh, strife or uh, uh, pain amongst farmers that some of them have been committing suicide. But I've also read on the other side that that certain politicians in opposition to the farmers have have been, uh, people have come to their house in the night, uh, uh, they've received abuse um, uh, from, uh, from uh, I guess, people in opposition to them. Uh, what What's the story then since 2019 until this election? What, what's, what happened? So what I, if I speak to farmers, what they say is, you know, they, they'll say, well, we were initially, you know, we're very open to dialogue. If there is some way that we can help, you know, we, they were, they're people of good faith. So they talk to the government about, okay, so what can we do? You know, can we maybe implement some, some new technological um, solutions? You know, uh, what are the, the models that you're using, for example, to calculate the nitrogen deposition, maybe maybe that the one that you're using is not right for it. People, 
Dutch people are very, very open usually to compromise and dialogue. You know, the word polder culture is something that is very, very pivotal in our culture. And it basically means exactly that. Our political landscape is always characterized by compromise and co coalition forming. And Povo, what was the word, sorry? Polder culture. What does so that mean? Polder literally means it, it is the, the construct of the farmland, actually. And, you know, the the, um, the word escapes me, escapes me now, but like... How do you how do you keep your soil um, like fertile and, and and wet? Is it irrigation with water? Yeah, irrigation. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, just a little bit more water, a little bit less, a little bit more, a little bit less. You know, that that's polder culture, uh -huh. and so that sort of very Dutch mindset of compromise. You know, that used to be a really, I think, a good thing, uh -huh. and um, characterizes us as a nation quite well. Is now being used against these farmers. So our government has been, I think, fighting a war of attrition with them mm -hmm. where they just change the tune every single time. And the farmers are like, they can't, they, they don't follow, you know, like, why? How huh, you said first that we were using this model, then we changed everything accordingly. We did exactly what you asked us. Now you're changing the rules again. And now you're changing the rules again. And now you're changing the rules again. And that's how they feel, you know, and they, and they're, they're trying to, again, argue with reason you know, and with rational, rational arguments to say this doesn't make any sense and the government just doesn't hear them. Of course, they don't hear them if you know what the real agenda behind it is. Uh -huh. And if the, the end goal is just no, we want your land, you yeah. know, then it makes all the sense in the world. But I think it has taken a while for, well, maybe even the majority of the farmers to start realizing that and to wake up to that fact and, and, and notice that the government actually isn't open to any dialogue, isn't open to any other solution than um, voluntary voluntary sellouts or, or expropriation and they're sick and tired of it and they have really they're not just sick and tired it's that's maybe even a too kind way of saying it these people are at the wit's end mm -hmm. you know they they see they are subjected to all these minute rules and regulations that they can't seem to influence and they're forced to cut down on their they've already been forced to cut down on their livestock every year you know little by little and it's not just like oh you know 20 cows need to go that all has a ripple effect in their businesses. You know, they, they need to be able to support themselves as well. Yeah. And like you said, there, there are many farmers who've actually committed suicide because of this, because they just don't see a way out anymore. Do you have a concept of how many? Well, we had, a, we had at least four in the past like six months that I've heard of, wow. but I know of, of many more, huh. many more. So, I'm, I mean, I've spoken to farmers who say now there are dozens every year. Wow. It seems from a polit political point of view that even if um, even if they were right about the nitrogen crisis, that it's such a drastic um, policy that, that, that they would see that they would need to implement any measures very gradually and help the farmers with the change. Is there, has there been any uh, sign of that at all from the Dutch government? No, uh -huh. no. So the ruling party, our minister of uh, stickstoff, which is nitrogen. So we actually have a minister for this, which uh -huh. just to me, you know, the clown world that we live in. But anyway, um, she uh, she said, no, these these goals are sacred. She called them sacred. And even with the elections results coming in where they, you know, they suffered a tremendous loss and this new party outflanked them by seven seats which is a lot you know in a, in such a small senate mm -hmm. of 75 in total the, immediately her response was well well yeah it's interesting but uh, nothing can change there, this is non-negotiable and she said it with such arrogance mm. and she had just suffered a massive loss but these people don't seem to care mm -hmm. you know it's 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 just like no sacred. sacred do you think that was a time where the mood changed in in the netherlands to fully support that that this election result that's happened, yeah, was that obviously this is a great marker of, of the change. But was there a time before where it's where it, where people who were maybe unsure about w where they stood on it actually turned on in favor of the farmers? What, what when did when did that last change? summer? Last summer, summer, the summer of last year. Mm -hmm. That was when uh, well when the protest became worldwide news also. And I think that was because they, the farmers really took to the streets in a very almost undutch way. Like, like I said, you know, country of compromise, of, of dialogue all the time. We are not the French, you know, we don't riot. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we don't go on strikes. Um, honestly, also most farmers yeah. never would want to go on strikes and don't want to go to protest because they have a company to run, you know, mm. it's not like, 
they can just afford it to, to take off uh, for or take their, their a couple of weeks off to, to go and protest the government. They, that, they, they'd be shooting themselves in the foot, right? Mm. So they we're not the French. We don't do that. But then this summer, I think because they were so at their wits end, um, there was a they, they united and they went out in the streets and they protested in a very well, quite radical way for Dutch standards. So they took their tractors out in the street, which is obviously a very like power. It's powerful imagery mm -hmm. to see so many people in their tractors out on the street, blocking, blocking, for example, the highways, mm. blocking distribution centers. And I think the blocking of the distribution centers, which is what they did, that woke quite a fair amount of people up because I think in this distribution of what? Um, sorry, supermarkets. Supermarket. Okay. So, you know, like we we're modern day people. We half of the time we don't realize where our food comes from. You know, we go to the supermarket, we don't have to do anything for it. I mean, we pay an amount, an insane amount for it nowadays with the inflation, but we don't have to work for our food. It's a given, you know, we take it for granted. Uh -huh. um, so a lot of people don't realize that those farmers actually, you know, produ produce their everyday nutrition for them. Mm -hmm. But when the farmers went out in the summer and they blocked those distribution centers for the supermarkets, within a couple of hours, the milk and the eggs were gone from the supermarket mm. and those shelves stayed empty. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was a really, really powerful image. You know, no farmers, no food. That was really something that stuck with people. And, and the idea of expropriation is something indeed so radical, you know, that even the most, you know, politically inactive Dutch person would be like, oh, oh, the government taking away your private property. Uh -huh. Hmm. I don't know if that's a good idea. And these protests were very, very successful um, and they gained a lot of attention, especially because the Dutch state cracked down on them with violence. And I think that was what caused a big shift in the mindset of, of the Dutch. Did people. they deploy the military? So they deployed military and, yeah. uh, and a lot of police forces. And it, it all came to a head when at a certain point, one of the, uh, of the, I think of the protest sites, which was at, I think on a highway, there was a young boy in a tractor who um, who was there with his family and he was driving a tractor and he, he was driving away from the protest. And this kid got shot at by the police. Like, you know, crazy, wow. crazy. 16 years old. He was- um, Was he it a rubber think, bullet or? Yeah, yeah. no, no, a, a real bullet, a real bullet, not rubber, like a, a proper Why one. Why did it hit him? It, it, thankfully, thank God, he wasn't hit. His tractor got hit. But so you could see the dent from where the bullet had hit the tractor. And, you know, he, he the boy was completely traumatized by the event, obviously. And then media came and they, they shot the photo of, of the boy sitting in the tractor. And it would have been a matter of two centimeters or he could have been killed. Wow. And the fact that that happened. In a and then so they lost the public then. Presumably. I mean, in a so-called free democratic society where people supposedly have the right to go out and protest, these people were not violent. They, you know, they were, they, they're not carrying any weapons. They're not armed. And the fact that the police officer shot at a child, yeah, it shows you the insanity. Do you think right? that it was a, a police officer, like a, a, a particularly sort of fu funny character? Or do, do you think that he, in any, do you think the police officer represented the attitude of the rest of the of the forces then? I think he represented maybe not the attitude of the, all the other police officers on the ground. Mm -hmm. I think generally speaking, you know, I've said this before, I think most police officers who are patrolling on the streets, who go to these protests, who were with us, for example, at the rally just last weekend, most people support the farmers, mm -hmm. but they get orders, mm -hmm. you know, and they get orders from their superiors who listen to the establishment, to the Ministry of Justice. Mm -hmm. And I think there the orders were very, very clear. You know, our prime minister is allegedly has called our farmers and I wouldn't be surprised if it's true assholes and a pain in the ass, you know, behind closed doors. And I think, of course, that's how he talks about them. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine that when they're briefed, you know, when the police forces and the military are briefed on these protests, that they use strong language and that they are like, let's, let's get these people out of here as soon as possible. Because obviously the protests were very successful, mm -hmm. were very, very successful. And if you want your policies to survive, then you can't have the public opinion shift. Mm -hmm. So they tried incredibly hard to have that not happen with the help of, I would say, well, most of the mainstream media in the Netherlands also, you know, the, the really? efforts. Oh, the efforts to vilify the farmers have been incredibly extensive. Really? Incredibly. All the way, even at that point, even of the, yeah. the, the, the yeah. shooting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because then they'll say, 
you know, I, I even heard you mention it just now, a couple of minutes ago, you said something about that there were people who went to um, like some government officials' houses, et cetera, mm -hmm. to talk. Yeah. Um, is that true? Which is, yeah, th that's true. Uh -huh. But, you know, if you see how the media writes about it, and the, the real story is that they went and they said, could we potentially ask you some questions about the policies? Because we have some solutions and we would like to discuss them. You know, none of it was threatening violence or anything. And obviously... Well, there's one story that they brought to a specific vegan politician a sack of meat yeah. in the middle of the night. Yeah, very now, intimidating. <laughs> hang on a sec. That is not appropriate. Like, no, but that, appropriate... I mean, I get it, right? But the thing if is... If anyone is comes that, to your door in the middle of the night, it's intimidating. I don't, I don't think it was in the middle of the night. It was in the evening. Obviously, it was dark. But, um, you know, it, it was all taped. Uh, and I saw it, and I mean, if you're a politician, I can imagine that you don't want people at your door. But sure thing, or anyone. For you that matter. Yeah, you might not want people at your door, but you, if you are a farmer, you might want the government out of your house mm -hmm. and out of your property. You know, like I think, in a sense, we need to see this in a relationship to each other. Mm -hmm. So if imagine everything that you've ever worked for is going to be taken away from you mm -hmm. by these people. Mm -hmm. They're completely unwilling. They're desperate completely unwilling to reason with you you're not hurt they're they're trying to bleed you dry your 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 friends your family are going insane you know people are committing suicide you're about to lose everything that you've ever worked for and you show up to a politician's house in despair and you say can i talk to you and then you are vilified as the as the evil the bad guy in the story you know that that's how the media portrays it mm -hmm. and and I, i'm sorry but i will say no i think that i think it's fair I would go very far to protect my uh, my property and my life and my family if if somebody wanted to take it away. And uh, you know the fact that the farmers have never actually been violent, I think shows you what type of people they are and they're good people at heart. Mm. What well, I'm interested by the media the media aspect. So you have media completely coming off the off the farmer, and yet now we have this rally last week, as you described. The mood is completely shifted what was the mood at, at the at the rally actually was very what, what? very positive and it was it just farmers or was it farmers and citizens so, so farmers it was, and citizens. The, the, the the protest was organized by both a citizens movement and uh, the farmers movement so the farmers defense force they were one of the organizers and the other one was called together for the netherlands uh -huh. so it was a group it was a mixed group of both farmers and uh, just civilians who were concerned in general with the government's policies uh -huh. so one of the slogans basically of the rally and and leading up to the elections has been stem ze weg which means vote them out uh -huh. so that was the general sense of the of the rally was vote the current establishment out uh -huh. so that they don't get the majority in the senate and hopefully won't be able to push any of these new laws and what, so the media then that have been against the farmers throughout and uh, this the last few years, how have they covered the rally and the elections? Well, the, how are they dealing with it? They're not dealing with it very well. So the rally, you know, there was I think there was one instance where a, a, a farmer on a trucker on a tractor, sorry, uh, knocked over a fence. You know, and then that was the main headline. It's like, oh, you know, they're using violence. No, no, nothing else happened if you were there. It was completely, I, I thought actually the, it almost felt like a festival at a certain point because people were happy. The sun was shining and we had just had horrible weather. Um, the mood was really calm, like really actually nice. It was almost enjoyable. You know, people were just in really good mood. Uh, and we had all sorts of great speakers. I spoke myself and it was, it was, it was a very exhilarating event in a way because people felt you know we can do this we're here with a lot of people we're going to stand up it was an exciting time and then well the elections came and well the establishment suffered a big big blow yeah and now they're doing the same story over and over again you know it's a, the, this bbb party which is actually quite a moderate party uh -huh. i personally at least think so they're trying to say oh they're so it's far right you know and the, the whole the whole strategy is the same. We've seen it. We've seen it for years, and they just try and do it again. So the vilification process, you know, has started, and I don't know if by people, the media, yeah, I, yeah, by the media, and I don't think that people will fall for it again. It's just like it's the the wind's too big. You know, they can try all they want. So then, what are the implications of this election? What do you think this means for the Netherlands? So at the like I said, the the elections were provincial. But they're very important because they direct, indirectly uh, dictate what our Senate 
is made up of, so which parties. And now the ruling parties have completely lost their majority in the Senate. And our Senate is a chamber of reflection that ha holds a lot of power. So we have obviously the parliament, you know, our house basically of commons, um, and then Senate, our house of lords. And they both have equal voting powers on laws. So they need to pass through both chambers in order to come into force. Mm -hmm. So if the Senate doesn't want, you know, to vote in favor of a party that the government proposed in parliament where they have a majority, then it's not going to happen. And so with this, you know, if they want to push new law that allows for, for example, expropriation, which is currently not legal. They can block it. They can block it. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, so it's massive. It's it's really, really important. But then we'll have to see how it goes, obviously, with the coalition formation process. Um, like I said, the government has lost its majority, but with the help maybe of the L Labour and Green Party and some other tinier, more fringe, extreme left parties, they could potentially still gather a majority for these policies. So we're not completely out of the woods yet. Ah, I see. Yeah. Do you think that the BBB are a party here to stay or are they a sort of single policy, single issue party that are going to deal with this specific cause or what do you think the future looks like for them? I think they're definitely, they have the potential to stay because the, the woman who leads the party is a very down to earth, you know, um, almost, I would say in a way, almost old fashioned politi politician in the sense that she's just a common sense, you know, non no nonsense type of woman. And I think that appeals to a large um, part of the Dutch population. But she's she's very informal in the way that she speaks. So she also gains, you know, people. She's funny almost, also like in the way that she talks, and and she's she's. I think she's likable. That what it, I think it will depend on is how well she delivers. Caroline van der Plas, Caroline van der Plas. Uh -huh, okay. So it depends on how well she delivers. Mm -hmm. so the thing is, is that this party is actually not fundamentally opposed to nitrogen policies in the way that, for example, I am. So I've always taken the more radical stance of saying none of this is real. You know, it's it's a manufactured crisis in order to take away our rights, which we've seen happen during COVID, for example, you know, and fear mongering in order to get people to give up their rights. Um, I think that this is the same, but just, you know, with a different subject. So Caroline van der Plas takes a different approach. She says, no, the, the, mo the models that are being used are faulty, which they are, you know, they are faulty. And so she says we need more time to implement these measures and we need different calculations. So faulty, but not without some merit. Like she would accept that there's a nitrogen crisis. Yes, she accepts that narrative. And that's where I personally am a little bit worried because if you, know, if you realize really truly what the government wants to do here and what their aim is, if you get stuck within a circle of lies and you debate within the allowed narrative, then I'm not sure that you're going to win. But maybe, you know, I'm obviously, I'm a political commentator. I stand from the sideline, she's in the system. Maybe this is her strategy. Maybe she thinks that this way, you know, they will gain time and the government will again have to reveal its true colors because it obviously won't accept uh, other models to be used to, ca to calculate the nitrogen deposition. And maybe she's hoping that that will wake even more people up to the fact that all of this is nonsensical and that their party therefore will grow as an opposition party. Um, it could grow or they could, you, the Netherlands could be greeted with an even more radical party, extremist party that that sometimes happen if they're not listened to. Yeah, that could happen too. Mm -hmm. So it depends how she's going to deliver and who she wants to cooperate with. Because, you know, we have what this could mean now with the Senate potentially blocking all of these new policies, we could have new national elections coming soon. If the cabinet falls over this, which is, you know, imaginable, then we will have new elections very soon. And, and if Rutte is voted out of office, finally, hopefully, I pray to God on my bare knees that he will be, then, uh, then we'll have to see who she wants to be potentially even ruling with, you know, if she becomes- So she could big. be the next prime minister of the Netherlands? Well, I mean- Potentially, that, possibly. If we see the results now, if, she, uh, if these were the national elections, she would have been the largest. And then she would have been the candidate, the, you know, for, for, for prime ministership. Yeah. Is there any uh, link to this with Euroscepticism? Is this tied in any way to um, EU policy? Is with the far the farmer movement? Are there, is there a Eurosceptic nature to it at all? What what's yes. the what's the mood there? Absolutely. Yes. Oh, all the farmers they they say we are being ruled not by the Hague, but we are being ruled by Brussels. 
And that is something that obviously is incredibly upsetting. We, you know, the, the the sense of not being a sovereign nation anymore. The government is hiding behind EU regulations. Obviously, you know, they have their own national interests as to why they want the farmers' land, but they're using EU law for it. So yeah, you know, it, it at heart is this fight again. I think from you know a national interest versus a more globalist or or EU centrist sort of worldview. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, it's completely at the core of it. Absolutely. Do you think this could turn into a, is there any chance of the, the Netherlands leaving the EU? Is it just, is that, is that too distant on the agenda? Yeah, I think it's, it's still, we, we probably need a few more years for that. Um, so this farmer's party, for example, says that they're not in favor of a Nexit. We would call ours a Nexit. Nice. Um, I am 100% in favor of Nexit. Uh, but the you know, the media coverage that, for example, the UK has had with Brexit, if you talk to anybody, you know, who isn't, who doesn't read any alternative media or doesn't read even the UK press, everyone in the Netherlands thinks that you guys are completely, you know, lost and that everything is going to hell here because of Brexit. And so that image has really stuck with the Dutch and they're afraid. Mm-hmm. So we, you know, we get told all the time, oh, we're too tiny of a country to be able to do it by ourselves. We would ruin our entire economy if we, if we leave the EU. So I think the majority of the Dutch population is not ready, sadly, for an exit yet. But you are. Oh, oh I, would be, I, would, I would love to be the new Nigel Farage. <laughs> I would take that role on any, any second. Yeah. So what's the Dutch case for an exit? I mean, it's the same as yours. Eventually, it's a matter of democracy, of sovereignty. Do Mm -hmm. you want Brussels and some bureaucrats there to dictate what your country looks like? Or do you want to do it yourself? I mean, I think it really quite literally is that simple. Mm -hmm. Do you want to have control over your own borders? Do you want to have control over what your own landscape looks like? How your farmers are regulated? uh, How much immigration you allow? All of that comes back to the eu mm. you know the majority of our laws cur- currently are being drafted in the eu and while well, the democratic legitimation of those are um, are very slim i think personally so yeah i would 100 percent say we should have left yesterday instead of tomorrow so well maybe that's still ne- after the farmers uh, situation has been resolved that'll be your next uh, uh it will resolve the virus activism. issue too Huh. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, if we get if we leave the EU, then we're no longer bound to these ridiculous nat- Nature 2000 rules, for example. And then our government. What's the Nature 2000? Those are the the natural uh, reserves or preserves ah, that yes, need to be okay. protected that our government's now using to enforce the nitrogen policy. So they're basing it on these EU regulations. But if you're not if you're no longer part of the EU, then you know they would have to just push push these laws themselves. And then, you know, that wouldn't fly. It clearly already isn't flying. So, uh, ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you about net zero, mm-hmm. if I may, mm-hmm. if I still have, t- if we have time. Uh, uh, sure. So you're here in London to make the case um, against net zero. Now, if in, in Britain, whether it's mainstream politics or mainstream media, the conversation on net zero skips whether or not net zero is a good idea <laughs> yeah. straight to how do we implement Net zero and and um, Theresa May in twenty nineteen uh, committed to net zero by twenty fifty and the successive governments since then have all backed it. What's the case against net zero? Well, I mean, it, it will basically. I'll I'll go back to what I've been saying about the Dutch farmers. The case against net zero shouldn't be. You know, do we do it in two thousand forty? Do we do it in two thousand fifty? How can we reach it? The case should be. Not even is this necessary, but we should just say, no, we see through what your actual agenda here is. And and I think that's why you should just say, you know, you shouldn't debate within the circle of lies that they allow you to debate in. But you should say, no, no, we see what you're doing here. You know, this net zero plan is not actually about saving the climate or avoiding the world from being destroyed. Mm -hmm. It is a political decision that is used to crack down on people's freedom and people's rights. That's what I think net zero is. Because again, same same mechanism as with COVID, but net zero is a more efficient one, basically, because it affects all of us. Mm -hmm. If you have an entire population that is led to believe that our world will be destroyed within uh, you know, Greta Thunberg in 2018 said that we would already be <laughs> probably uh, wiped off the face of the earth now. But if you get, especially the youth, to believe that, and if you get people afraid, then of course you're going to be able to implement all of these 
rules that will restrict our personal freedoms, you know, like the 15 minute cities, like the, uh, the cars that we no longer will be allowed to drive, um, maybe even potentially personal carbon credit systems, you know? So yeah. I think I've always taken the line. We shouldn't debate within that premise. We should see it for the pretext that it is, that is being used for a different agenda an agenda that is oriented to or on control rather than the climate. Mm -hmm. So Dutch farmers are, you know, the nitrogen policies are also part of net zero. It's, it's all in this, it's all the same idea. Well, so this week the, um, the IPCC released, uh, their new report. I think it's the sixth report. Now I've only skimmed it, but from first glances, it's more alarmist than the last one from 2014. So they are very much making the case, that's the UN, that uh, not only is climate change uh, 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 human uh, caused by humans, which I don't think anyone really argues, what they argue is actually how bad is it and, and how, how bad is it for us to implement the net zero. I guess I'm sort of assuming you agree with that, that you, you do think that climate change exists and that it's, horm it's human, it's caused by humans, but that actually it's, it's not as bad as everyone thinks and that it needs to be um, dealt with uh, but without hurting people. Well, I think the apocalyptic narrative is incredibly dangerous and is a, is a means of political control. So it's, you know, fear mongering and especially in the world that is completely secular, um, West, which the Western world is becoming more and more so, it has really taken, I feel, the place of a new religion, mm -hmm. but not in, a, in none of the good senses of, you know, the word. Um, so I think people are very susceptible to the idea of finding meaning through, you know, preserving the planet and saving the world in that sense. Mm -hmm. So they're more focused on the creation rather than on the creator, so to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that is, that's dangerous because that can be used for, that can be abused and misused by people who have a different agenda that is actually way more sinister. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think with the climate um, agenda, we've seen that already before. We've seen the fear mongering. My parents told me about acid rain, you know, um, when I was a bit younger, they were talking about the ozone yeah, layer. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, you know, it's the rising sea levels, but it all seems to be not actually quite as bad as they make it out to be. So then you have to wonder why, you know, why would they, why would they be doing that? And are there, even if we assume that what they're saying is true, is the solution that they are proposing the right one? Mm -hmm. I think that's what's interesting to me is that is the solution they're proposing the right one. And if you read Klaus Schwab's books, it's, they, they, it's, you get the impression that they've identified, or he, he identifies uh, climate uh, climate change as, as a, a crisis that's kind of unsolvable, unsolvable, except if we cede power to those uh, enlightened um, and and anoint self-anointed elite. Right, and, and that's where the the, the sort of the difficulty it's, seems to be, yeah. rather than. Uh, uh, in, in policy where it's like, okay, well, we, there is change and we, but everyone's a part of the change. It's, it's actually, no, we need to hand over everything to them. That seems to me to be the crux of, uh, it's always, the problem of the, their always. hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah. It's always a rules for rules for thee, but not for me type of situation. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, we, we can talk about the examples forever, but all these climate um, meetings that they have, you know, th they always come in their private jets, mm -hmm. but then, you know, somebody who works their nine to five job uh, pays, I don't know, up to half of their, their income in taxes uh, that wants to go on holiday once a year to Spain to forget about, you know, their miserable life, Though that, that man can't do that. Mm -hmm. They can't have their meat at the dinner table anymore, you know, mm -hmm. but they get to eat steaks, travel around the world, maybe potentially even buy their carbon credit, you know, by the time that that comes into existence, which I think it will, because, you know, it's being very, very openly discussed. Mm -hmm. it, I think this will be a sort of neo-feudalist system where for some people, everything will be possible, but for others, nothing. Is this what you, back at the beginning of the conversation, you, you used the term perfect consumers mm. is that what is that sort of tied into this neo-feudalist concept i wanted to ask what what is a perfect consumer what what is that a reference to 
Yeah, so I think that's that's basically the um, the goal or what you know the globalist institutions of this world, people like Klaus Schwab that you just you know refer to, want us to be. Because if you are a perfect consumer who doesn't believe in anything higher than well either the government, the climate, or whatever crisis they you know choose to, to fly with in that period of time, um, but that is what consumes you, and you consume their products, mm-hmm. then you're you know, you're a perfect cash cow for mm. the establishment, for the system. Obviously, somebody who's hardworking, um, who wants to serve a higher purpose in life, um, who wants to have a family, who pays attention to what they spend their money on and, and doesn't live a completely materialistic life, is much, much less good candidate to be a perfect consumer than somebody who's completely isolated, doesn't have a moral or philosophical fundament you know it doesn't have a national identity all of that so i think yeah probably the Where have you, where's the perfect consumer think narrative come from is that uh, is that from the wef is that because i've not i've not come across that in, i mean I, I don't think that they would call it that no you know they obviously want to tell you that you're a completely free sovereign being and that you're doing the right thing mm-hmm. and that you know you'll own nothing and you'll be happy type of narrative you know that is something that comes from them mm-hmm. and i call it you will be the perfect consumer because that's what they actually see you as. You know, they don't see you as a free individual with rights that are endowed upon you by your creator. They see you as somebody that they can make money off of. And if you are too critical of the government and if you see through their actual plans, you won't be that. Mm -hmm. So of course you want to numb people. You want to dumb them down. You want to subdue them, you know, and you want to make them believe that this modern day lifestyle is is what will actually make you happy Mm -hmm. because then you're easy to control. And so it is your hypothesis that what we're seeing in the Netherlands with the Dutch farmer results is the first or one of the first, not the first maybe, but one of the first uh, revolts against that ideology. Yeah, I think so. I think that's what it symbolizes. And that's why I'm, you know, even though maybe politically speaking, I don't put all of my solace in the political party system. You know, I I don't know if this BBB party will live up to its claims, if it... um, if they don't just find a way around it. But the fact that the people, you know, went out in such vast numbers to vote for a party that literally has the word farmer in its name, yeah. you know, that's amazing. That's that's why I'm excited about this, because it, it shows you that, you know, maybe not everybody wants to be the perfect consumer and we are not just going to sit back and allow it to happen and, and you know, have live our live our lives in our 15 minute cities and and eat uh, manufactured food or printed uh, 3d printed meats and insects and 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 watch all stupid woke netflix shows etc you know maybe some people want some a uh, different type of life and i think in a in a small sense this is this shows that that reflects that people actually don't want that type of life at all well on that incredibly positive note ava mm. vladingersbrook <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking with me. It's been fascinating. No, it was fun. Very fun. Thank you so much.